Oh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. I'm Francis Seeley from Global Net 21, and this is one of the regular webinars we do weekly, often on Tuesday evenings, not always, but usually. And we try to get interesting people who try to make a difference in one way or the other in changing society or influencing society. And we have all sorts of people, not just from the United Kingdom, but from across the globe. And today we've got someone from Slovakia, Andrea Titalova. And we've asked her to come on and do this webinar because she is very interested in politics. And she's interested in politics because I think I'm right in saying she thinks we do politics badly. She thinks we need to have more innovation and more consciousness, be aware of consciousness in politics. And she also believes that women can play a greater role and already do play a greater role. So we're pleased to have uh, have Andrea with us today and you can see her here and we've got Fong Skovgaard as well who will be joining us to ask some of the questions. Anyhow Andrea thank you very much for joining us and let me start by asking you can you tell us something about yourself and your background so we know something about you. Thank you very much good evening good morning good afternoon to everyone who is watching us today. I'm very pleased to meet everyone who is watching and thanks you reserved your time and I'm very curious what we will explore with Francis on this interview on innovations and consciousness in politics and very briefly my name is Andrea Titilova and as Francis said my passion is uh, the consciousness and innovation in politics. I am catalyst of innovations and consciousness in politics and initiator of uh, global GQ impact platform on conscious politics, which really wants to create an impact in the world. And Francis, I would like to also ask you, why did you decide to invite me for this wonderful webinar? Gosh, an interviewee asking me a question. Oh dear. Well, the reason I invited you is that clearly we're interested in politics and we're interested in people who are looking at ways in which we can do politics differently. And we've done lots of webinars and meetings about deliberative democracy, participatory democracy, sortition, assemblies, the way people get together, women in politics and so on. And when uh, one of our members said that you were doing some work on this in Slovakia, I did a Google search on you and looked at what you were doing and then I thought it was incredibly interesting and very important to have someone outside the UK telling us about the work they did. And so that's why I got in touch with you. I'm very honored and I'm very honored to perform all the work that Global Net 21 is doing uh, in London and I'm also happy to explore more physically in London and also over this interview where everyone can put a question and we can be in this amazing interactive way of sharing and asking the questions, as answering them and answering your questions as well. Okay, so you've told us a bit about yourself. I mean, what you didn't tell us is what brought you to wanting to do this? I mean, what happened in your life? Was it your study at university? Was it your disillusion with politics? But what brought you to doing the things you're doing? It's been my passion since 14 to be in politics and to have an impact on uh, national things uh, for the students, for changing the system of education those times. And then it was uh, four years later when I decided to run in the local elections in my district and making door-to-door -door campaigning and really find out how important it is to talk to people and how important it is to find out who they are, who are your electorate, but also how value, how big value they bring into your life. And since then, I'm now 27, since then the passion has lasted. And after I was being deployed in European Parliament and in Washington DC, uh, one of my dream came true, but I saw I need to maybe do something more for my country, but also for Europe. And that was the year 2012, 2013, when I came back and when uh, with my business partner, we decided to found the organization, which I am a founder and CEO, Youth Politics Education. And it was a passion to bring value-based people or politics. And it started in Slovakia. And I will mention later on 
we then expanded more and we also attracted more important partners. So it's been my passion for doing politics, my passion to meet politicians and my passion to collaborate with people. Okay, so that, that's a passion we share. We've got Fong with us today as well, who's also, I know, interested in consciousness um, and, in, uh, and in, with women in politics as well. Fong, have you got a question you'd like to start to ask? Yes, I am. Um, no, I'm not. I, I don't think I'm as passionate as you are, but um, I, I'm thinking more about um, your, if you are in to info politics um, about education. What what do you do? What are you fighting for or for women and young children, young girls? I was privileged to become a part of a global network, global institute. It's a global institute for extraordinary women, founded by two amazing Slovaks who believe into aligned power of extraordinary women. And as a part of GFU, it's an abbreviation of the Institute. Uh, I became one of these women who are extraordinary because we believe we can change some society. And we are really about to transform the humanity through aligned power of the women. And concretely, what I did, I took it over and I was very much, you know, aiming and young politicians and young women who are running to engage them into the politics, but also to engage them into GFU. Because GFU still brought for me the education, which is transformative in a way I honor myself, I honor the environment, my community. So we decided to create a program for women who are also in politics to work with them as professionals, but also as the women who have their purpose, who have their passions, who have their goals. And we, this was a program we created for, as a starter and a pilot for 20 women in Slovakia. And then we saw that we might go beyond. And that we saw this year in April, when uh, really the vision has emerged in GFU. And we decided that uh, the part of one of the platforms on conscious politics, where we will be helping also women who are causing the things in politics to either be connected with interesting business people or get an education they need to run or just get a valuable contacts and network. And I've never uh, been helping for the girls. I mean, very quickly, I've been uh, working as a mentor and helping other young ladies to run because I was 18 when I was running and I'm still young. Uh, but I haven't been working with uh, ladies who were in elementary schools. I would love to, maybe in the future. But I've been always working with the uh, ladies who were at high schools and then at universities. And now women all over the world. Okay. So, um, you know, you, you started your interest when you were 14, you got involved when you were 18, you're still young like me, um, like all of us. <laughs> and um, you, you now want to make a difference. But what I don't understand to begin with, what was it that you felt was wrong with the way we do politics at the present that made you want to do what you're doing? Did you see things that you didn't like? What is wrong with politics as we do it in the present day? I wouldn't say what is wrong. I, uh, it occurs to me that we need to innovate it more. That's why uh, in 2017, last year, with one of the organizations in Slovakia, we decided to do the Forum of Good Politics, which should bring the dialogue about consciousness and values of the country to improve the politics, to innovate it, to, to do it differently than just from uh, having or holding a mandate and being a parliamentarian. And this was the first thing we got out, it's not, it's not wrong, it's about dialogue. These people have not really a dialogue of what to do differently. And this was the first thing I was missing and we started to do. So I think this is something. There is no dialogue between politicians, between grassroots and the connection between them. And the next thing which we saw and like uh, was visible in the action was the conference on innovative politics we did this year in Prague. And there I would say that with dialogue, there is a, something new happening. There is something new born in a conversation. 
and that's from innovation, innovating the ways you foster politics, innovating the, the ways you engage different interest groups and stakeholders. We explore this in Prague, and I think this is something that is a little bit missing, the, the way the politics is done. And last but not at least, I think that we have enhanced a lot the tech industry, we have enhanced artificial intelligence, but we still do operate on a level of consciousness as a, as a countries that started many, many years ago. So I think that one thing that is missing and could be put there is that innovation through people who want to do it differently. So first you talked about communication, about dialogue, and then you talk about innovation. So dialogue was innovation for you and differently. In what way do you think it should be different? A dialogue? Yeah, so, so, so you, the dialogue was one thing and then you said again later on that you would like to think that they would like to do it differently. What, mm -hmm. in what sense differently? I will take the example, concrete example of the forum we, we did. Imagine we gathered 50 people who are stakeholders on all the sectors in the society and we gather them together. It's not a lot, but they were representing everything, local, grassroots, politicians, business people. And one of the intention was to bring them into dialogue on the values that Slovakia was having as a country and make them think how these values reflect their current state of being in their business, in the politics, and how they, these values can be brought into dialogues with their stakeholders, you know, clients, people, citizens. And they had to think it, about it by themselves. Imagine in a room where is a dialogue happening, no speakers, no keynote speeches, really people thinking about how they can evaluate on this and then have a dialogue with their counterparts. So they were you know, sitting around big round tables and they were speaking what they found out. And on this occasion, I would like to mention the organization that was our partner, Dialogue, the Center for Collaboration, that has managed to cause this national values assessment, which is a Richard Barrett assessment. So, okay, so it was, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the dialogue is the different things that you are referring to, and it is the innovation that you are mentioning. So, so far, have you done it for how many countries? Yes, the dialogue is just one tool. I want it to be concrete for everyone who's listening to us. The other tool can be what we saw in Prague, like involving different stakeholders into action. So, for example, grassroots lobbying initiatives to lobby with big business uh, environment companies to combat against CO2 emissions. This is also an innovative approach. I mentioned dialogue because it, was it, it had a concrete impact. I would mention this as well because it was also concrete. It happened in Prague where people from UK actually who are running these kind of organizations met with business people of tobacco industry in Prague and they discussed it again in dialogue what is possible to be done. So I mentioned dialogue as one of course. There could be many more and I think this is also about new policy documents and about new communication of these grassroots initiators who have already the funds to make the positive impact on large corporations and politicians who have to listen to them. And when you asked about countries, I think that the conference in Prague demonstrated that we can involve Europe and uh, in the Global Institute for Extraordinary Women, we also start to be in touch in impact platform with America, with the US notably, and, and some women from Mexico. But as such the dialogue and the way we started, we started last year. So I wanted to stick to concrete projects that happened in Slovakia and why not to develop it in different actions in other countries. Yeah, so I mean, what you're doing in Prague, you've done with other people as well. And we know in this country, there are other people doing similar things to you. And that sort of network of doing politics differently is, is, is interesting. Now, you talk a lot about consciousness and you talk about, a lot about innovation. And politicians and other people will say, well, yeah, well, we are conscious and we do innovate. So what's special about those two words to you? What does innovation and consciousness mean to you that's different? 
first and foremost important thing is that we connect. I would use a practical thing uh, about the platform. We connect free stakeholders, which is something unique. And these are people who are on a grassroots in a politics, uh, who are running for a position in a parliament or who are already there and who are business people and want to have a you know, return on impact. I would see these kind of like three major focus groups that are bringing something new because the platform is an impact platform. I'm now speaking about this, can create this. So I believe this is something new that in the world there are some kind of these platforms, but I believe that this is something new. I wouldn't say I'm bringing something new, totally new cutting edge, but the way that we can consciously connect with some values, with the principles that we, we hold as, as human beings is the way we can innovate it and, and do it differently. And I will help here with my role model and our partner and this book, an author of this book, Lobbying for Change, who is my very good friend, professor and citizen activist, Alberto Alamano. And Alberto has founded one of our partnering institute, Good Lobby, which is helping people who want to take a stand for some cause in lobbying. And they just want to do it and they want to have tools how to do that. And I think that bringing these tools, not only for lobbying as he does, but bringing it also for running a new campaign, for doing a different way of fundraising, you know, involving people who want to have an investment that is in a return of impact or bring and educate women who are eager to make a change in their communities. These are all new ways, I think, that politicians has to someone start listening. And we might see it in the real elections results in Europe and also in US. But I'm not going to into this, but I think this is new. Okay, Fong. Yes, I, I'm a little bit intrigued about this. So, you know, you, it is not just politicians that you are working with or try to change, you also do it in the commercial world. Is it correct? You are thinking about people and how to do business and connecting people and, and, and how to change. So I, I just try to see the link between the businesses and the politici politicians and the community, how you connect them and how you go about this. Mm -hmm. I will use two concrete examples for everyone who's listening to us. First is youth politics education. Uh, since we started, we had these three groups in a focus. And why? Because people who are in business and who want to do something different, they sometimes don't have time to do it different in a civic space, but they have resources. And they don't want to waste their resources, but they want to stand for organizations who can make this impact and can connect the right people with the right change in the system. So this was the interconnection when we started. And the second example, and they can bring wealth, not only money, they can bring their contacts, they can bring new programs for you to open your eyes where to apply to get some grant or funding. And they can also help you uh, when you start a new program. And this is the second example, very good one. When we started uh, the first ever internship program in Switzerland, in 2013, it was in Zurich, and we brought Slovak young people to Zurich to have an internship. And we had exactly three groups that helped us to get there. First one were politicians, exactly the Swiss ambassador to Slovakia. The second one was us as YPE. But the third one was those times our chair of the board and a CEO of Adidas Group of Central and Europe and East and other donors who were like helping us to get there to Switzerland. And this combination made a unique space for making it happen. And it was the first time in the history of Switzerland that this happened, that there was a real Slovak deployed for six months, paid internship, and then she got back and she was deployed in our municipal town. And now she's, I think, the, the, the vice chair of the Department of Construction. So there was a, it would not happen if these free groups would not work. And the third example is also global platforms and GFU. Because 
you already have people who want to make an important difference in the world with their wealth, not only finances. And they also see there are people who do the difference and do not have that resources. So why not to connect them? But I gave you three examples and I could go more with examples, concrete ones, where it was very effective that we connected these three pillars. No, they are very impressive and uh, very impressive results. Um, how, how can you say, like the companies, they can ask you, what's in it for me? What, what, what do they get out of it? Uh, you mean the business people? Yeah, or? yes, yes. And the government. What, what would be the benefits for them? Mm -hmm. I will use the example of uh, the Pra conference. It, was, it is the recent one from May uh, 2018. We had these three stakeholders. And we made a conference where the representatives of two businesses, what, what, one headhunting and one lobbying industry and one tobacco company met on one side. And they were also supporting the event where the real grassroots initiators from UK and from Germany met and Italy from Good Lobby. And where people who came there from whole Europe to attend the event. They were really like people from grassroots initiatives because they took travels from all Europe to come to Prague. And what the businesses saw were two important things or a leverage for their business. They found new contacts, but they also tested how their product or for example, how their services or what they do is resonating with people. And what I mean by products, they were not selling, they were just sharing what they were working on. And I will show you a very concrete example. There was a lady from tobacco industry and I wanted her to talk about lobbying in tobacco industry because it's also a part of our politics. And she started to sell the products on one side and then the audience and some people from the audience started argumenting with her and it was amazing constructive debate. And she told me after the event that she's very happy that she could be part of the panel because she never been in such a like amazing debate to know what to follow. And the same said a business person who was a leader of Czech Revolution, Velvet Revolution, who is now a headhunter in Czech Republic, very respected. He said, wow, this is cultivating something because otherwise I would not be sharing a stage with these people. And next Next to them, there was a man who is doing the most famous biomedical research that is impacting politics. And they told him that we might maybe help you because you are bringing something for a public. And the audience then can, could relate to them. So now we maybe see the constellation of people on one stage who are from these three sectors and they interact and they see where is the leverage for them to make an impact. Well, some people, I mean, the two sides to that argument, I mean, some people would say uh, what you're doing um, is uh, you're helping businesses to be more responsible in a way and you're getting them to find out what people want and what their needs are and, and, and to respond. Other people are set, would say that you're making, a, you're, you're providing a cheap forum for companies to reinforce themselves and their profits and you're upholding the corporate system. Do you ever have sort of doubts about what you're doing and you see both sides of those arguments? Thank you for this argument, Francis. Uh, I wouldn't, I would regret the second one because uh, as you asked me before, what's consciousness? You can very easily distinct who is conscious and who not. Doing something new, disruptive, or doing something which is really against morals. And maybe some, some, now someone can say, okay, but tobacco or any lobbying industry is not uh, conscious. But I don't speak about that. I speak about moral principles. And this is something we don't question. But if you really work with people who want to be disruptive and enhance this, this, this Europe, this, this continent and this world, you just have to bear in mind that there might be these arguments. And to concrete, again, I will use lobbying for change as a current initiative, which is happening in the European Parliament, which is proposing the disintegration of the most strongest European Parliament fraction. And when we were sharing it among grassroots, people were cheering it up. When we share it about people who are in politics, not business people, politicians, they said it might be 
like one of the most stupid idea ever. But here I will help with the para quoting the one of our summit speaker of GFU, who said that who was a, who was on the top of a Michael Gorbachev uh, organization and helping him to, to stabilize the, the regime. And he said that like world has to be disruptive. I will find his name and I will send it to you. But okay. the world has to be disruptive. And we have to come to disruptive things because business, and that's the point, business has got to that way. And we in politics haven't. And it's fine. It's, it's like it is. It's not wrong. It's, it's like it is. But now we have the millennial generations. We have sustainable goals. We have people who do amazing things in Paris in two weeks, you know, on the biggest chance summit. This is disruptive already. So let, I would say... Let, let, let me interrupt, just let me yeah. interrupt, because th that term yeah. disruptive is an interesting one, and a lot of people are beginning to use it now. They talk about disruptive technology, disruptive politics, disruptive communities, and they look upon it as a positive way. Explain for people who've never heard that term, what disruptive politics is, in, in your view. For me, disruptive, when I was also listening in, is to just bring some change, you know, some real change that people never have been expected before. And in the beginning, it's triggering them. And then in the end, they say it was a great idea. And I will be concrete. When we started the internships in Switzerland, we also wanted to start the internships in uh, Slovakia. There are no paid internships in Slovak government. And we wanted to change it. So we asked the Ministry of Education as educating platform, as a YPE, to start this initiative. It took us a year and you could see all the people at the ministry always rejecting it. There are no money, there is no resources, there are no tables for people. You can imagine in a ministry of 20,000 employees, there might be a table, there might be some small scholarship. But it was like, you know, resilience to get out of that old paradigm that something was and used to be and go to something new. And we were disruptive. I was sitting at these meetings next to the minister and I was explaining to all his staff with, uh, with other people how it's possible. And it was really strong message to say someone, please get out of your budget this amount of money and then it make you stronger because you will have another people on your, in your office and they can help you to make it happen. So I would say this, is a, this was a small program. Disruptive is also now what we decided to because the vision of transformation of humanity for aligned power of extraordinary women and men in the different fields is also disruptive because you cannot imagine something concrete on this. But it's basically, again, the space for creating something new. So, so first you talk about uh, bringing businesses, people, the three different groups, government, business people, and the audience together. Mm -hmm. And then you also have internship. Mm -hmm. And you talk about transformation for women and men. So you have a lot of different initiatives. Or, or, or what is your main focus? Mm -hmm. My main focus are, is... Uh building up uh, the youth politics education, establish it in Slovakia. There is still a big thing to do on, and then a platform on conscious politics. All the activities I mentioned were the concrete projects because I want everyone who is listening us to not to feel this is some metaphysical discussion. I want everyone to see this is like a practical tool, hands tool, how they, they can do something else. So I'm bringing these examples to demonstrate these maybe big terms like consciousness or innovations or humanity into concrete actions. So I'm still and two pillars, which is youth politics education, bringing value-based people to the politics, mostly in Slovakia, but also in, in Europe. And up to that, scaling up, being part of something global, which is Global Institute for Extraordinary Women, and being one of the initiators of global GF back platform and yes. all these are the activities that can bring like your perspective yes it makes sense so the platform you are talking about can you explain a little bit about the word platform mm -hmm. 
like a word, if you ask, it should be a space, you know, like a, a space, a realm, maybe for some native speakers to distinguish. It should be a realm and a space where people would come, we would, not, we would land. Okay. And uh, there, is, there is not a specific, you know, legal, legal boundary of that. And if I can mention here, and you ask about platforms, at GFU, GFU has been in existence since 2013, and I was a part since 2015. And after doing global summits and causing like big things for women this year, we decided to go further. We had a big constellation summit, which meant we wanted to tackle four important areas in society, in the world, and bring some consciousness into that. And from that, there we had the business, conscious ecology, conscious combat against human trafficking, and conscious politics. And these days we are, it's not only me, we are eight women and other women who would like to have a stand for specific platform. And we are three of the women from Netherlands, UK, London, and myself with GFU support and win people in a core team who would like to stand up for conscious politics. You, you're, you, you talk about a platform in, in a way, I think you're in the same business as we are. I mean, you have a different focus, but you're about increasing public space. Um, you're mm -hmm. trying to create a way in which you can extend the public square so people can come and create dialogue and learn, develop a knowledge base, all that sort of thing. Is your platform that you're developing, do you see it to be a public space online, a digital one, or do you see it to be a real actuality face-to-face face -to -face one as well, or is it both? I, I cannot answer uh, how, we, how, we, how we do that, but what I can answer is that uh, we are now in a starting process and that there will be some mastermind calls and some events where people could join. And this is also my, my ask for anyone who is listening uh, I would love to spend a time with you one-to-one -one and talk more about possibilities, how we can connect and how we can, uh, how we can make the things happen. So uh, there won't be physical events around the globe. Uh, GFU uh, and also YP now, both of them are online because it's, GFU is global and YP is becoming more European because we have students who are from different parts of Slovakia, parts of Czech and parts of Europe. So it's more this way because it's more convenient and also we live in a world that everyone has different time zones. So it's still much more easier for people to, to be online. Nevertheless, this year in April 2018, we did the first physical meeting of GFU in Prague. And we know the whole world basically arrived. So there was some physical gathering as well. But uh, this is really about next year. But for the platform, we would, I would love to really get anyone who would be interested in touch and inform very individually because this is a prototype. This is a prototype we are starting. And still, of course, if anyone would be interested in, in talking more about conscious connections on, in public, then there can be different discussion. And are you, are, you say you'd like to meet people face to face if they're interested and you're coming to London in a couple of weeks time. So if people want to contact you, is that OK? Please, I would love to, uh, because that's a point why people like me are really willing to come to London. For me, London is very vibrant and amazing city to meet people. So I would love to get in touch with anyone who is watching this interview or who will have it recorded then. And definitely share, meet, and, and talk more. And you can find me on Facebook and you can find me also on other social media. So my pleasure to, to meet you or even, or even have a chat with you online if you are not physically in, in London. Peter Fotham's actually put something up on the chat on the webinar system saying, you know, there's an interesting project in Madrid, in Madrid um, concerning citizen participation in budgeting and decision making and of course there are other experiments around the world not just there i mean the debate around abortion in, uh, around abortion in ireland was based around a sort of you know a, a, a sort of series of assemblies or an, an assembly where people did engage in dialogue 
So are you in contact with these other initiatives that are happening in the world or are you there doing your thing or are you collaborating? I don't know about this one in Madrid and uh, also if there's the one you mentioned in Ireland also and we are starting to be in collaboration as I mentioned Good Lobby is one of the organization but I'm very we are not the only ones and my most important value in life is collaboration. I think there we can create something. I would love to know other organizations who would love to enhance the system in particular areas of politics or social change. So definitely I'm open and I would, I would love to know, uh, know more organizations. Of course, there are names I know and organizations that do it amazingly. But uh, as I say, and I love this quote uh, by someone I don't know who told it, but it's a very famous one and for me very important one in life that if you want to go fast go alone if you're going to go far go together okay so please, everyone who has an idea i would love to know about it i'm eager to know more to find out more and get to know more people who are doing great things in europe in the world anyone who's listening to us okay so we'll go together now with fong over to you <laughs> Nice one, Francis. Um, yeah, so um, about London. So what, what, what do you have an agenda for London? Um, I, don't have any, I, have, I don't have any agenda now, so I would not like to stick to this conversation about only London specifically. But uh, I never forget that there, were, uh, there was a space to to create the things. And there are organizations which are interestingly doing the things, innovation. And I would say, use one example of the organization we invited to Prague. And uh, I love what they do. They were only the UK's those time because we also started. It was Influence Map Europe. Uh, I don't know if anyone is, uh, is familiar with, but they are well established in London and they are great in uh, terms of uh, promoting uh, better environmental systems and quotas, saving the world from CO2 emissions. And they are really great at lobbying against like CO2 emissions. So this was the one I was in touch with, but uh, I, I would love to explore and know people who are doing another great innovations uh, in politics in your area and also around the world. So there is no a specific agenda for, for the day by day, but again, I uh, would love to share definitely. Okay, you, you, you mentioned in, in one of your answers the importance of the fact we're living in a digital world and we haven't developed the right sort of consciousness for that world or probably the right sort of aptitude for that world. And Barnaby Flynn is very much into blockchain uh, at work. He has a blockchain platform and he's doing quite a lot of work around that which involved direct online democracy and he's saying I think he'd like to make contact with you and he would like to um, you know cooperate with you in some way so if you look at his chat you can um, do that and maybe Barnaby you could type your email in so oh, that uh, so yeah. that um, you know Andrea has it but I mean what did you mean Andrea because it's very interesting about not having the right sort of consciousness for the digital world the digital world in a way has changed everything hasn't it it's changed the way we do politics the way we approach politics how we consult people and most politicians and most countries haven't really come to terms with that have they in what terms you mean? Can you be more specific, Francis? I want to address. Well, they haven't. They haven't understood it in the way that you do. I mean, they don't. Under, many of them don't understand about blockchain platforms. Many of them don't understand that uh, you know the social networks mean this that people want to do politics in a more and engaged and direct way, and they're still in the old representative model, and it, they're slowly moving away mm -hmm. to a new form of consciousness about digital network politics. Mm -hmm. I know there is one, uh, there is one uh, amazing organization in London who is doing it through the technology. It's called the Board Group. So you might know who is on the line from London that this is something like that. But uh, yes, as you say, people know that there is a great tool to use digital networks to make a change. 
but again, how the people will take it? I'm not an expert of digital or artificial intelligence, but uh, there was a great article recently, yesterday, published by Yuval Harari, which is the famous author of uh, Homo sapiens and Homo Deus. And now he has another book, Lessons of 21st Century. And I haven't read the book, but the article he published yesterday in Guardian was very well mentioning one thing, that in the times of the spies and in the times of uh, strong Soviet regimes, people could maybe spy on you, but they could not get to your brain that KGB or KK, Triple K, could not get into your brain and manipulate you. These days we have AI which can do that easily. And I am not a big oppo opponent of AI, but I also like really afraid what can you know, artificial intelligence uh, do with us and how we can really work with that, maybe in politics, but maybe also in other uh, professions. So, yeah, there are not many. There are, though, many organizations who are already great and combining, as I told Ford Group, combining digital technology, improving politics. So, and this is my great friend, Alvin Carpio, who is running in London. So I think it's better to also approach the Ford Group on the digital agenda. But I would like to just be briefly on the blockchain. One of the Impact Platform founder. Uh, who is uh, from Cyprus and who is initiator against uh, human trafficking is organizing amazing event in January and exactly we explored how much blockchain can help to detect people who are suffering and who are the victims of human trafficking. So I love what you raised, Francis, that how great and, and useful these tools can be for the bankers, but not only for politicians and for society. And it's good for me to consider. I never have been in, in, in touch with an alternative currency, actually, only reading about it and understanding it a little. But as you mentioned it now, I'm getting more present to that. I will be honest. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, by the way, Deirdre Lane, who's watching this, um, I'm not, not sure if it's on Facebook or Zoom, can't type what she wants to on Zoom, but she's uh, given me a couple of links, which I've put on the chat, if you'd like to look on the right about citizens' assemblies and uh, um, citizen engagement. So you might want to look at that. Uh, she does a lot of work in that. I think she's in Ireland at the moment and knows quite a lot about what's happening there. So Deirdre is a good person to be in contact. Anyhow, Fong, over to you. Yes, I um, still, I am very focusing on education. Mm -hmm. So if we could go back a little bit about talking about the internship. Mm -hmm. So what, how, what, what made you think about internship from another country abroad? It was, uh, it was my internship that I did in the European Parliament. It was a long internship I did as a contract when I was studying in Brussels. And I never forget the day I was having a badge and my dream came true. It, was, it used to be my dream, you know, to go with the badge as an intern and to be in a parliament. And I was standing in a square maze in Brussels and I was thinking, wow, how great it would be when people in Slovakia, young people, I was 20 at the time, could do internships in institutions and like have quality internships, you know, really based of kind of conduct. And the same happened after a year when I was in Washington at one of the prominent lobbying department as an intern and employee. And again, I was like, wow, what could be amazing when Slovak people could experience something like that? And we didn't do it in Brussels because there is it well established and neither in, in Washington. But after a year of existence, the chair of uh, our board and the former CEO of Adidas Group, he was studying in Switzerland. And when he was listening to my vision of YPE, after a year of existence, so 2014, he came to me and he said, you know, just, or 2014, just let's go to Switzerland. And I was like, all right, you know, we are one a year in existence. We kind of like, we don't work after one year, like you would work after six. And you want to go to Switzerland? And he said, yes, why not to be disruptive and brave? And this was the point we, we caused the Swiss ambassador. This was the point when we caused it ourselves. And we just made it happen. And we involved business people who helped us to fundraise for it and, and invest a little bit into us. And we just went there for Rojo in 2014. And it took us another year to bring there a person. 
So it was my experience. It was a passion of him as well. It was also understanding of this amazing Swiss ambassador to Slovakia that this is needed. And it was a team we did because we were a team of people doing this. The board people, people in Switzerland. So I think it was combination of this. It was courage. It was disruption a little bit. And it was also the, the trust into our value. Because since the beginning, YP was not about two people. It was about organizations who came into collaboration with students. And it was about, you know, mutual respect and values. And this was something that resonated with Swiss people. That there is a conscious way and morals and values. Okay. Um, the, the other thing would be interesting for you to tell us about is um, women and why women are, are, are important in what you do. Why are, do you concentrate a lot on women? I mean, you talk about a global forum, uh, I'm not sure the right name, of Extraordinary Women, which always seems a strange name for me because it assumes that there are women who aren't extraordinary and it sort of, you know, sort of marginalizes them. How do you sort of say to every woman and every person, you know, you count as well, and why are women such a, an important focus on what you do? Extraordinary, it's a global institute for extraordinary women. For me, extraordinary woman is every single woman who wants to go beyond her own comfort zone and beyond her own well-being and wants to invest something and give something out, make some legacy. So this is extraordinary for me uh, to be just to make it clear for everyone who is listening to us. It's not making you special and more superior. It's making you more even human because it's the reason why we live here. We live to like leave some legacy from us. And why women for me, I would help to, with two things. First one is the quote of my favorite role model and also our GC speaker, Lynn Twist who said that there will be a time, and it might be a time now, when the male wing of flying will be tired and there might have to come also the female wing and then the bird can fly. Then the bird of humanity can fly. And I believe that this is the purpose, to bring women not into level that this is now our time, but bring them into the collaboration with men, bring them into the balance. And I am woman and I am passionate about doing a change, not because it's only about women, it's about women who wanna take a stand for something more and who wanna be an aligned power. And what I mean by aligned is that we support each other. And this is something that brought me to GFU, to institute and to politics, because what you see these days, and I would answer to pop punk question as well. There is not so much collaboration, even among women, because there is a problem to, you know, maybe give up part of my ego to bigger purpose. And the women characters, which bring, you know, that, that, that ability to more collaborate, maybe to more express the things differently, see the things differently, have a complex view, is amazingly shaping this way of politics. So it's, it's part of mine. And also, yeah, because why women? Because I think that now it's a time for, for this wing to fly with the main one because it's, it's our humanity, it's the world. And we see it in real US elections, EU elections, populist parties. It's all right because there is still, you know, tyrannies of one energy already. So that's why women and Okay, that, that, that's a very, very good answer. Fong, over to you. Um, the thing is that it is very impressive about the women thing. And um, I, I think it is very beautiful. I'm a woman myself and uh, I, I feel like that I have, I may not have done enough, but I have also done my bit to contribute to running this, you know, the, the world. If, if you mean my part of the world. So um, I slightly disagree that it is about time for women to take part because a lot of women wanted to take part, but they may be hindered by one way or another, the social life or the, the, the personal life or whatever happened to them, you know. So 
And um, I think this more the fight that people are thinking about now, not because women didn't want to take part. It's more because that they have been hindered to do things. They really want to because I think the women feel the responsibility to to make it happen like men. Because in the last 50 years, a lot of women are single. So they also provide and they, they support the family just like a man do. Thus, um, this is one part of it. The other part of it is that it is your, your, your kind of ver visualize the thing, how it should be, how we should run the world. So can you evalu evaluate a little bit about how, how the women can help the men to run it? What, 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 what do you have in mind? How the women can help them. Okay, I will write it down. How the women, I love this question. Yeah, yeah. What, I mean, what, what would women bring yeah. to, to the, the flying bird to yeah. make it fly more successfully and effectively? Thank you. Thank, first of all, I would love to appreciate what you shared because I love what you said about women and it's exactly about that. I don't want to say it's only about the women. And I agree with you. It's every single woman who brings something into community. I completely agree with you. So just wanted to acknowledge your being and what you shared. Thank you. Because it's exactly also what, what I stand up for. And how the women could... Uh, I will bring my, you, my own example. I don't know if it's the best one. It's just one that I experienced. There are many men in society, in business, and also politics who who want to support women. I think it's not a discussion about that men don't want to support women. I think that women can do one thing. They can just really courageously stand for who they are and, and ask if the man wants to be a part. And I will share a part when I, when I started, when I was running, when I started Institute. There was my courage and there was also my, my vision, but there were men who stood up and said, I can support you. And it's the vision not only of me as Andrea, it's a vision that I have within someone. So I think that women could engage men into their activities, their visions, what they want to do. They maybe can engage them when they are running into positions. Practical example for everyone who's listening us from local politics. Fortunately in Bratislava, in the capital of Slovakia, we are having local elections where many women are running. And I will have one example of one woman who is running for a mayor of an old town, which is a part of Bratislava district. And she has an amazing job. But the way she's engaging with a man in her team is the way that the men are expecting her to represent. But maybe I wouldn't see, you know, that she would be the one that would like to shine. Nevertheless, I would vote for her. So I think that men wants to support us. We just have to let them you know, to do that. And we just have to also engage them more into our visions. Because for example, in US, when I was there, I was in lobbying industry, but I was very young. And you are Slovak, you are the youngest one in the lobbying department, and you are in a steel industry. I was in US steel. So you can imagine who you meet in the Congress. You meet old men of 60, 70 years old who've been there, and you have to do something. So you have to be introduced by someone. And it wasn't only a woman who introduced me. Those were also men. And it was my willingness to share my vision with them and ask them if they can introduce me also to some powerful women. So I think that it's the way that the bird that is flying is that exactly the men and women will be interdependent in collaboration together. In GFU, we have mentors who are men. I personally don't believe in the space where only women will fill up the room and will be women for women. I think that also we need as women offer a space for men to, to help us and vice versa. So, and also in the platforms, we saw it this September. In the core team, we are talking with men and women. In the mastermind call, we had the first call in the tw on 22nd of August. Again, practical example for everyone who would like to be the part. We had men and women on the call. So it's not excluding them. I think it's really including them, but don't forget that we can also shine with them. 
Okay. I mean, it sounds to me like it's not about male and female. It's the Chinese yin-yang, the two sides to all of our nature. And it's trying to get that balance, which the bird that you talked about has. We're coming very close to the end now of, of our time, but maybe I can ask you one question. If there are people out there who watch this on webinar, on Facebook, and they're citizens who want to get involved in innovatory and conscious form in politics, um, they may not know you, they may not be able to contact you. I mean, how would they start something? How would they try to change the world in the way that you are trying to do it? You can start by doing your, your own initiative, which you like, and you are passionate. But I think also you can just join the initiatives that are existing in the world, in your region, in your country district. That's the first thing. The second, you can run for office. Please do, if you feel like that. I felt like that and I did it. It was the best experience in my life. Just do it in a small elections. Try to make your campaign talk to people. Join the bigger causes, like I mentioned over this conversation. There are platforms now and there, there, these platforms are like opening up for people. So you can just join your flow, as I'm always said. You don't have to do something on your own because sometimes there is already something invented. Fourth, and I think this is the most important thing, you have to take a stand for something. This is uh, the expression of my favorite role model, one of them, uh, Lindquist, who really clearly said, like, if you take a stand for something, a whole universe will shift and unexpected things will happen. And practically, please get in touch because I'm really, I really love connecting with people. I believe that the consciousness connections, conscious connections should be in place. So knowing each other and uh, listen, what are the needs of the people you want to work with? You can make petition, you can lobby for something, you can just contact and do something with your classmate. I found YP with my classmate from university and high school. We are business partners and we met on the tram uh, after two years. So it's very concrete. You know that these people are close to you. You don't have to look up into biggest role models you have in your life because those will be your mentors maybe once. And also get aligned and find your, I would say, soul sisters and soul brothers. I found them in a global institute for extraordinary women. And I found them in the founders of this institute, Bea and Tatiana, who are sisters and who do this business and who are Slovaks. And it's for me, the biggest legacy that you can find people who will cherish you, nourish you, support you. And even if they are not from your mother, they can really help you to grow. So also find these kind of networks. Okay. And I have to be in touch. Okay, that's great. Well, we've come to the end of our hour now. So thank you for doing that, Andrea. And thank you, Fong, for, you know, taking part in this. I mean, it, it's very interesting because, you know, there will be a lot of people Thanks. watching this who do politics in a traditional way. They get in the adversarial nature of politics and into the blame game. And they don't sort of want to get involved in the politics of dialogue very often. They, they're quite happy in the, in, in the sort of to and fro of bickering politics. But there is another sort of politics that's growing and it's a bottom up growing politics of people who want to engage in dialogue and consciousness and try and change political culture. Um, throughout their country and other countries as well. And you're very much a part of that tradition, which many other people are, are as well. So thank you for telling us what you're doing in Slovakia and what you're doing in other countries as well. And I'm sure people are interested in what you've said when we get in touch with you. Deirdre has already sent me a couple other links that I put up on the side. So I know she's interested and many people are as well. So thank you. And, um, you know, I hope people will contact you and you may meet some of them in London. Um, so thank you for taking part in this and uh, we'll end this webinar now. Thank you.